Looking back, do you remember the first day where I presented a switchboard? It was a switchboard from a ship used to control diesel generators. It had a bunch of meters on it, some of which you already know. For example, frequency, voltage, and current. It also had some meters that you didn't know. One of them was real power, and the other was something called VARS for volts, amps, reactive. That's the topic of today. We're going to present something called complex power and the power triangle. When we're done, you'll be familiar with this, where we talk about P for real power, Q for reactive power that's associated with inductors and capacitors, and S for apparent power. We started our AC with a discussion of phasers. For example, you might have been told in the time domain that the voltage was 120 root 2 cosine of 120 pi t and a current I of t of 4 root 2 cosine of 120 pi t minus 30 degrees. The conversion from time domain to phaser would give you a voltage of 120 at a phase angle of 0 degrees and a current of 4 amps at a phase angle of negative 30 degrees. You also learned how to plot phasers on the complex plane. So here's the real axis, the imaginary axis. The voltage vector lies here, 120 volts, angle 0. And the current vector lies here at 4 amps, phase angle of negative 30 degrees. From our previous discussions, you also learned how to work impedance problems. The total impedance for this circuit is 2 plus J. That's this piece here. Plus this piece here. And that is 7 in parallel with J10. Using your calculator, we'll do this piece first. So that would be 7 invert plus parenthesis 10j, close the parenthesis, invert equals, invert equals. The total impedance is impedance 1, which is 2 plus j, plus this second impedance, which is 4 point, we'll call that 4.7, plus j 3.7. Nine. We combine the terms. We have a real piece of 6.7 plus an imaginary piece of J4.29, and that is in ohms. While we're here, we may as well figure out the current. So the current assuming this is 120 volts at a phase angle of 0 degrees, the current is that voltage divided by the impedance. For that step, we're using Ohm's law, where a voltage is a current by an impedance. We can enter that in the calculator as 120 divided by parentheses 6.7 plus 4.29j. And we'll put that in polar form, please. So our current is 15 amps at a phase angle of negative 32.6 degrees. If we wanted to know the voltage, 
for example, maybe we wanted to know the voltage across R2 and L1, it's useful to use the voltage divider. Before we do that, let's redraw the circuit. So here our impedance 1 is 2 plus J, and our second impedance was 4.7, I think it was, yes, 4.7 plus J3.29, all driven by a 120 volt source. We'll assume a phase angle of 0 degrees. For clarity, let's label this point A and this point B. If we wanted to know the voltage A to B, it would be the impedance of interest over the total impedance by the source. So voltage A to B is equal to 4.7 plus J3.29 over the total series impedance which in this case is 6.7 plus J4.29, all multiplied by 120. Parenthesis, 4.7 plus 3.29J divided by 6.7 plus 4.29J equals, and then multiply that by 120, and shift it into polar form, because that's what our meter will read. And we see a voltage of 86.5 volts at a phase angle of 2.36 degrees. I suppose the next question we should ask is, what is the power in this part of the circuit? I mean, after all, we have our current and we have a voltage, we should be able to do that. How do we calculate power in the AC world? On the DC side, you remember that power is equal to a current by a voltage. In the AC side, this transforms into complex power as a vector is equal to the complex conjugate of the current by the voltage vector. Remember that complex conjugate means to flip the sign. For example, if you had 2 plus J5 as a current, the complex conjugate of that is 2 minus J5. Or if you had something like 30 amps at a phase angle of negative 20, the complex conjugate is 30 at a phase angle of 20. You see, all we're doing here is we are changing the sign. That's all we need to do with complex conjugate. While you have your note card out, we should add a few more things. Now, remember on the DC side, when we talked about power, we always said power is equal to IE is equal to I squared R is equal to E squared divided by R. We have the same formulas on the AC side. We talk about complex power. The vector is equal to a voltage vector by the complex conjugate of the current, which is exactly what this says here, is equal to the magnitude of the current vector squared by the impedance is equal to the magnitude of the voltage vector squared divided by the complex conjugate of the impedance. When we use the term magnitude for our voltage and current, just remember that is a scalar. This is the value that the meter would read. For example, if your current was 4 amps at a phase angle of 10 degrees, you would use the value of 4 in this piece here. Let's go back to our previous problem and see if we can figure out the total power. So we know the current is 15 amps at an angle of negative 
we know the voltage is 120 degrees, and we know the total impedance is 6.7 plus J 4.29. S is equal to the voltage vector by the complex conjugate of the current. So S is equal to 120 at a phase angle of zero, so that's the voltage, by the current. So that's 15 amps at a phase angle of 32.6 degrees. Now keep in mind that this has a sign that's positive because our original current was negative. We took the complex conjugate of the current. S is equal to, using our calculator, that's 120 multiplied by 15 at a phase angle of 32.6. So S is equal to 1520 plus J970. And the units are volt amps because this is voltage here and that's current there. So we have units of volt amps. We can also express this in polar form as 1800 volt amps at a phase angle of 32.6 degrees. While we're doing these calculations, we may as well use the other forms. So complex power is also equal to the magnitude of the voltage squared over the complex conjugate of the impedance. Complex power is 120 squared and I believe our impedance was 6.7 minus J 4.29. Let's see if that's true. So our impedance was 6.7 plus J 4.29. And we used minus J because we're taking care of the complex conjugate. Using the calculator, that's 120 squared divided by 6.7 minus 4.29j gives a value of about 1800 at a phase angle of 32.6. While we're here, we may as well work the other form S is equal to the magnitude of the current squared by the impedance vector. I believe our current was 15, so we'll square that, and then we'll multiply it by the impedance. So 6.7 plus J4.29. Fifteen squared multiplied by 6.7 plus 4.29j and there's our value. It's approximately 1800 volt amperes by 32.6 degrees. In each case we end up with a triangle that looks like this. So we have about 1520 watts about 970 what are called bars and 1800 VA at an angle of 32.6 degrees. We'll come back to this momentarily. For right now, just know that this is called the power triangle. To understand the power triangle and to understand what bars are, we need to take a look back to capacitors. You'll recall something that looked like this, where we talked about time and the voltage on a capacitor. And that capacitor would charge up to the source voltage. And we even talked about things like tau. For example, at one tau, you achieve 63.2% of the source voltage. There were a few takeaways from this capacitor exploration. The first 
capacitors store energy. And the second, it takes time to store that energy. We even talked about the current that was associated with a charging capacitor. So this is current and this is voltage. From the labs, we observed that if the capacitor is initially uncharged, it will have a zero voltage when we start to charge it. At that starting point, the current will be at a maximum and the current is equal to the source voltage divided by the resistance that's in the circuit. Somewhere in all of this, you were introduced to Eli the Iceman, and that told you that in a capacitive circuit, the current leads the voltage. And that's fairly clear here. The current is at some maximum while the voltage is zero. So the current definitely came first. And then, as charge accumulated, the voltage was built up. The opposite is true in an inductive circuit. Here, the voltage leads the current. So in our earlier example, when we drew a voltage of 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, and a current vector of 4 amps at a phase angle of negative 30 degrees on the real imaginary plane, we could identify that as a lagging circuit as an inductive circuit. Here the voltage comes first, sometime later we have the current. Recall that these vectors rotate in a counterclockwise direction and as they rotate you as a stationary observer will first see the voltage vector and then 30 degrees later you will see the current vector. So voltage leads current in an inductive circuit. As another example, consider what happens when a capacitor is connected directly to an AC source. In the time domain, it looks something like this, where this is voltage, And this is current. If I've drawn this correctly, there are some interesting things happening where I draw these lines. You could look at it this way. Here's a capacitor and here's an energy source. If we connect up the capacitor like so, we could argue that it has fully charged. In an AC waveform, we know that our voltage source is going to change polarity. So now we have energy stored in the capacitor, but it's of the opposite polarity of what's in the battery. So when we connect it up, the first thing the capacitor is going to do is it's going to get rid of that energy, and then, and only then, will it charge up to the opposite polarity. Now it happens again. Our waveform changes polarity. The capacitor has energy, it has to get rid of that energy, and so it continues alternately charging and discharging. And it just so happens when you're at this point here, the capacitor is fully charged, so there's no current. Or when you're at this point, which is the same as this point, the capacitor is fully charged and there is no current. For those of you who took calculus, you could look at it this way. The current on the capacitor is a function of time is the capacitance by dV dt. In this case, our voltage is equal to cosine of some x. And the derivative would be negative sine of x, which is exactly what we see up here. Anyway, the takeaway from all this is that energy is alternatively added and then taken away from the capacitor. The same is true for the inductor. 
for that capacitor, the work or energy is equal to one half CV squared, and the work on that inductor is one half LI squared. Either way, it's this energy which flows in and out of the device each cycle. That energy flows back and forth between the source and the reactive component, such as the capacitor or an inductor. We call this reactive power. where those reactive elements are either inductors or capacitors. Something very important, reactive power does not do real work. It's almost like reactive power was imaginary, which brings us back to our previous problem where we introduced the power triangle. In that problem, we had something that looked like this. There was S, which is equal to 1800 volt amps. We had P, which was equal to about 1500 watts. And we had Q, which was equal to about 980 VARs. We would describe this as apparent power real power, and this imaginary one is reactive power. Let's take a few minutes to define these terms. So S is apparent power. When you think of apparent power, think about a meter. Apparent power is what you get when you multiply the voltage and current readings from your meter. So apparent power is the product of voltage and current. For example, if you had a circuit and there was a current and you knew the voltage and you had some load, apparent power is the product of these two meters. Remember that neither one of those meters is aware of angles. All it knows is the magnitude of the voltage and the magnitude of the current. Keep in mind that we're talking about apparent power, the scalar, not apparent power, the vector. P is for real power. P is the same as we used in the DC world. Power is in watts. And this is the useful work that's done. Some examples are mechanical power for a motor, light. Interestingly, waste heat is also part of this. To be sure, waste heat is undesirable, but it's still doing useful work because it's taking energy and converting it into heat. The last one is Q. That is reactive power. And this is power that just flows back and forth between the generator and the reactive components, such as the inductors and capacitors in a circuit. The units on S are volt amps. The units on real power are watts. And the units on reactive power are volts, amps, reactive. So we end up with something called VARs. Let's take a look at a few power triangles. We'll start with the ones that aren't exactly triangles. This is the power triangle for a pure resistive load. This is the power triangle for a pure inductance. And this is power triangle for pure capacitance. If we blend the resistor and the inductor, we end up with something that looks like this. There's P, Q, and S you'll notice it's positive. If we blend capacitors and resistors, we end up with this, where this is P, Q, and S. So we could say that capacitors have negative Vars, and inductors have 
positive bars. And resistors have no bars. How could they? They have no way of storing energy. As a side note, consider this. We can talk about S, the scalar, and S, the vector. In both cases, they go by the term apparent power. However, only this one accounts for the angles. Keep that in mind, because we did mention that S, the vector, is equal to the voltage by the complex conjugate of the current is equal to the magnitude of the current squared by the impedance and is also equal to the magnitude of the voltage squared over the complex conjugate of the impedance. Remember, that is only true for S, the vector, not S, the scalar. Remember that S, the scalar simply describes the length of the hypotenuse in our power triangle. Here's another term for your note card, and that is something called power factor. We'll abbreviate that as power factor, and we'll define it as the ratio, the ratio of real to apparent power, which shortens up to power factor is equal to P over S. Keep in mind that we are talking about triangles here. So this is S, this is P, and if you were to use your trigonometry, that looks like this one right here. A cosine of an angle theta is an adjacent over hypotenuse. So given theta, the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which means we can define the power factor as cosine of theta. Let's see if we can't put this together with a few examples. We start with the power triangle. Since it's inductive, we know that the bars are positive. Now S, the scalar, is 960 VA. Given this power factor, we can calculate this angle theta. We know that cosine of theta is equal to 0 0.8. That means theta is equal to the arc cosine of 0 0.8. So inverse cosine 0 0.8 gives us 36.9 degrees. We also know that the power factor is equal to the ratio of P over S. We know the power factor, that's 0 0.8. We also know S, and that is 960. Solving for P, 960, times 0.8 gives us about 768 watts. Of course, being as we have this calculator here, we could have done that operation much easier by saying 960 at a phase angle of 36.9, and there we go, 670, plus the VARs, which are 500 and 80. If we put this all together, we would say the complex power is equal to 960 VA at a phase angle of 36.9 degrees, or we could have said that the complex power is equal to 770 plus J580 VA with the understanding that this is the real power and this is the reactive power. Let's work one more example and then we'll call it a day. You are given power is equal to 2kW and the power factor is equal to 85% 
and inductive. We sketch the triangle. Since it's inductive, we know the bars are going to be positive. This is 2,000. We know the cosine of theta is equal to 0 0.85. Therefore, theta is equal to the arc cosine of 0 0.85, which is 31.7 degrees. We also know that the power factor is equal to P over S. We know 0 0.85 is equal to 2000 over S. Therefore, S is equal to 2000 divided by 0 0.85, which is 2350. And that's a volt amps. We can find the VARs using a calculator, or we could use Pythagorean theorem. So Q is equal to 2350 squared minus 2000 squared. Using the calculator, that's the root of 2350 squared minus 2,000 squared is 1230, and that's var. Putting this all together, the complex power is equal to 2350 volt amps at a phase angle of 31.7 degrees, or we could say that that is equal to 2,000 plus j 1230 VA, where 2000 is the real power and 1230 is the reactive power. To be complete, we could call 2350 the apparent power, whereas S, the vector, is the complex power. As we look ahead to the next lecture, Let's see if we can calculate the impedance of this circuit. So we're going to let the source voltage equal 208. And we'll assume that's at a phase angle of zero degrees. We said complex power is equal to 2350 VA at an angle of 31.7 degrees. We know this formula here where the complex power is the complex conjugate of the current by a voltage vector. Since we know complex power and we know the voltage, we can calculate the current. Actually, we'll do the complex conjugate of the current first, and that is equal to S over V, which in this case is 2350 at a phase angle of 31.7 over 208. So the complex conjugate of our current is 2350 phase angle 31.7 divided by 208. And there we are. That's 11.3 at a phase angle of 31.7. That's close, but that's not exactly what we want because we want the current, not the complex conjugate of the current. So the current is 11.3 amps at a phase angle of negative 31.7 degrees. Okay, we said impedance, we're almost there. We have another equation. I believe it's called Ohm's law. Since we know voltage and we know current, we can calculate the impedance. So the impedance of the circuit is 208 phase angle of zero over 11.3 at a phase angle of negative 31.7. So our current is equal to 208 at a phase angle of zero divided by 11.3 at a phase angle of negative 
that gives us a resistance of 16 and an inductor with J9.7 ohms. We could also have used that other equation where complex power is equal to the magnitude of the current squared by the impedance. So we could say that S, so that was 2350 volt amps at a phase angle of 31.7, is equal to the magnitude of the current squared. So that's 11.3 squared by the impedance. So the impedance is 2350 at a phase angle of 31.7 divided by 11.3 squared. That should give us the same answer. So that's an impedance of 16 plus J9.7 ohms. Well, that takes care of that problem. When you come back next time, you can look forward to problems that start to look like this. You guessed it. When you come back, we're going to work Thevenin and Norton circuits using AC. The good news is that you already know all of the rules because the rules are identical to their DC counterparts.